Peace, family. We back. Jaywalk. This is your instructional video lectures on how to move and maneuver and get through life. Um, this is episode five, and today's episode is very special to me. It's called Thug Motivation. And this was inspired by, right, this is fourth quarter. This is game time. This is no excuses, just results. This is cloth talk. And um, today, for those who aren't a part of my organization, you missed this uh, kind of halftime speech that I gave my team. And really not halftime, this is like, like fourth quarter speech, right? This is, this is Jordan in his prime. This is, listen y'all, it's fourth quarter and we down. The refs ain't playing fair. We at the visitor's court, we tired. I got the flu, everything stacked against us, but we got this. And um, so I wanna tell you guys a couple quick stories. Um, but this is about everybody, again, just being motivated in your own, in your own thug life, in your own corporate thug way, or whatever you're doing out there. Uh, we know as entrepreneurs, for those who are aspiring entrepreneurs or current entrepreneurs, that no matter all the glitz and glams of our business, um, there will be valleys and peaks, there will be hurdles, there will be a, adversity, there will be obstacles, and um, we gonna need that extra oomph in order to push through, especially for my CEOs out there, because the success of your company, it rides on your back as a visionary and leader of your organization. And so I'm proud of my organization, the team that we've built, all those that you know we employ and vendors that we uh, you know, support, uh, et cetera, and that we've been able to you know, launch just in the last several months the first ever black owned real estate crowdfund in the history of America and literally in the history of the world, uh, you know, an, an epic and historical organization uh, that has made tremendous strides already. We've raised over $10 million of capital commitments in our first week of our initial public offering and over $12 million of capital commitments to date. We just acquired a $2.1 million building that we negotiated pretty well, if I might say. Um, that's worth 2.5 million. Uh, we acquired this building at 2.1, that's $4 million, nearly a half million dollars of equity uh, in this asset. And we have some great redevelopment plans um, for this property, just one of many acquisitions to come under the Tulsa Real Estate Fund, the historic Tulsa Real Estate Fund. I'm proud to say that we've built our Wealth Education Institute up from the ground, from the bottom, from the mud, uh, to one of Inc. 5000's fastest growing companies uh, we actually just cracked into the Inc. 500, number 588 fastest growing companies in America of 2018, right? And so all that sounds good. But even within that, there is some obstacles. There are hurdles. You are dealing with human beings and people. And this is just not for entrepreneurs. I'm talking about you may just be a working class Citizen, you may be in college right now, in high school right now. You might be in middle school just trying to figure out how to get through science class. No matter what it is, you are going to go through some things. There are going to be some challenges. There are going to be some adversity. And you're going to have to learn how to persist uh, and be resilient. And what I say, you know, the Greek philosopher Jay-Z said, I ain't never been scared of a drought since I was 6, 17, getting money down south. Bowed it, bowed it, Master P. All right, anyway. So... Uh, we bout it, bout it around here. And so even with the success of my organization and our, our companies, um, there are challenges. And right now in the fourth quarter of this year, my company is being challenged. I mean, there are some deficiencies. There are some things that, you know, everybody looking around kind of crazy. We got, you know, members of the company that had to get let go. There were some people that were doing some unethical things. There were people that, you know, don't, don't see eye to eye. They, they beefing. There, there's, there's been some things now like this. We deal with people here. And our organization, um, outside of King Javi, who's, 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 who's the brown fam, our organization, and Queen Jazz, who's a light-skinned queen, our organization, no, I'm sorry, Queen Jazz. Our organization is majority uh, Africans in America, right? And so we're dealing with a, a large organization, pretty large organization of, of, of black folk and, and brown folk. And we have you know, some vendors as well who are European-American, other nationalities, but there's things that go on. And... As the team leader, I, I sense the morale was down. We got a big team meeting yesterday, and it started off good, and by the end, it was like a squabble. It was like 
one of our youngest, a 20-year-old Hope, that's what I call her, that's not really her name, but it's something like that. 20-year-old Hope had to literally call out our team, call out some grown men and be like, yo, y'all are like, she had to really give it to them. And she's a 20-year-old college student who works for our company. And I just felt that we were fractured and that there, we were kind of bailing out on our core values and our culture of professionalism and excellence and outwork the work mentality. And um, I was thinking about this all day and then last night I just got inspired and I just, I woke up and I was just, even against all these challenges, I just woke up feeling good. And I was just like, you know, we got this. Like, I got this. Like, last night, I posted on Instagram. I was, I was up for like a half hour trying to figure out the post. And it was just like, in me, it was like, nah, this is like, this is Jordan in the fourth quarter. Like, this is where greatness is made. Greatness is made where your adversity is at. Like, this is where you show what you're made of. That's what made MJ MJ. It wasn't because he was just a good shooter. It wasn't just because he was a good scorer. It wasn't because he played deep. It was... MJ was clutch. Like, you knew that the team could be down. You could be down 23 points in the fourth quarter. But you give Mike the ball, you got a shot, you got a chance. And that's just what I feel in my spirit. Like, yo, just give me the rock and get out the way. Just clear out. Like, I got this. And, you know, a lot of times as a leader, you want to, you know, certainly empower your team and allow them to do what they're gifted and talented at, what God called them to do. And so you want to empower others, right? You want to kind of get out the way. You don't want to micromanage. You don't want to be a ball hog. But right now, it's fourth quarter. We'll be down. And listen, give me the rock. Like, I don't, listen, all, play defense, rebound. Do your – listen, everybody do what y'all do. Give me the ball. Just give me the rock. Just give me the rock. Posting up, give me the rock. MJ, MJ, fade away, perfect. Simple as that. And so – Part of the motivation lecture I gave my team today and what motivated me and inspired me to look at the business and entrepreneurial challenges that we're currently facing is I was thinking, and I, I FaceTimed my little brother, Arthur Morrison, today, and he was, we were going back and forth. I was like, bro, he was like, man, you, you're glowing right now. I was like, bro, I was like, we're going through some things, but this, this is light work. And so I was telling my team, and I told him this story, and mind you, it's Tref Life. You know, we got the Tref Life merch, if you ain't know. That's Tulsa Real Estate Fund, if you ain't know. Go to treflife.com. That's T-R-E-F-L-I-F-E, treflife.com, to get this merchandise, right, of our historic fund. But I was telling my brother, shameless plug, it's my channel, so of course I could do that. But I was telling my brother, I was like, and I was telling my team today, so I was like, look at y'all. I know things, you know, I've been on y'all. I know we've been having a lot of discovery meetings. I know it's not like the most... You know, our company is usually fun and vibrant and, you know, the energy's high. And lately it's not been that. And, and it's fall and it's gloomy and it's the hour, the clock's got set back or whatever happened. And, you know, so it's just different. The energy's different. But I was like, I remember, and I told him this kind of story, is that I remember a time where I was 20 years old, super depressed. I mean, I thought the world was coming to an end. At this time, I was on parole in New York after serving a one to three year sentence. I had just got locked up in New Jersey for a secret indictment. So I was telling my staff, this is mine, this is one our, our every, every Friday we have a one o'clock staff meeting company wide. And I gather everybody in the room and I'm like, look, let's have some real talk. And I remember, you know, I was hustling and during this time period in New Jersey, my town in Somerville, New Jersey, they would round up all the drug dealers and lock everybody up who had served undercover police officers and give them what's called a secret indictment. It's like, you already committed a crime months ago, but we're gonna let you slide until some months later, and then we're gonna see if you commit some more crimes, and we're gonna lock you up. So secret indictment time came around and everybody in my town got locked up. But I'm chilling. I'm just like, yo, it ain't me. Like, I know I don't serve no cops. Like, you know, like, I used to, if I ain't know somebody, I ain't serve them. If I didn't know you and you wanted some work, you had to smoke or sniff in front of me like you got to prove to me you're not a cop. And so I'm just confident that I'm not getting locked up. And so the whole day goes by. I watch my cousins get locked up. My uncle gets locked up. Like everybody I know is just getting snatched, snatched, snatched. And later that evening, I have my red navigator going to Wendy's. My brother, Art Morrison, he's like young, 10 years younger than me at that time, probably 9, 10 years old. And we're coming back to my mom's house. I go in the house. And next thing you know, the marshals surround the house. They're like, yo, tell your son to come out. My mom's, my mom, like, she about that thug life. She's like, he ain't here. They're like, ma'am, we just seen him walk in the house. She's like, he ain't here. And so they're like, look, are you going to open the door or are we going to kick the door down? And so with that, I took off my chain, took off my bracelet, took off my jewelry, gave my sister 
you know, my glob of money I had. And I walked out, you know, gave myself up to the police to avoid my mom's door from getting kicked in. And so I get locked up on a secret indictment, right, from some guy that I served because my dumbass cousin Kiki brought some dude who he told me he knew. And I, instead of me giving it to Kiki, I gave it to the dude, and the dude happened to be a cop. And so they, they caught me, right? So bad drug dealer. Um, anyway, I bail out, and I go see this lawyer. And this lawyer tells me, because of my past criminal history in New York, that I was facing three years, that I was facing at least three years in prison, right, in New Jersey. Come to find out later on, years later, after I served prison time, I only was looking at four months in prison. They literally offered me four months. And so here's a backdrop to that story. At that time, when the secret indictment happened, I had quit selling drugs. I had quit drug dealing. I had quit hustling. I had saved up a nice amount of money. I bought me a pretty red truck. I had all the clothes I wanted. And I literally was applying for jobs at a temp agency because I knew I wanted this corporate life. Like I knew the streets wasn't all there was to it. I just didn't know how to enter a corporate office. I don't know what my career or business would be. And I only had a high school diploma from alternative school. But I had saved up money. I'm like, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to community college. I'm going to give me some khakis, some button ups. I'm going to be fresh. I'm going to holler at all the corporate girls. I'm going to give me a little temp agency job, make a little $13 an hour. I'm going to figure it out. And so this is my plan. So I quit drug dealing, was applying at a temp agency, was ready to go the corporate route, and then a secret indictment comes around. And this dumbass lawyer tells me I'm facing three years instead of four months. So when he told me I'm facing three years, I'm like, yo, I don't come home from jail broke. So I'm about to get on my extra grind to save up bread so when I come home from prison, I got some money. So now I just quit selling drugs two weeks prior. Now I'm back at it full time. And now I'm turning it up and I'm hustling in a town down in Maryland called Cumberland, Maryland, three miles from West Virginia. So mind you, I'm still on parole in New York. I'm going to see Miss Robinson on 42nd Street or 46th Street every Tuesday in New York. Now I'm on bail in New Jersey. And now I'm hustling to save up money for when I come home from New Jersey prison and I'm hustling in Maryland. After some, you know, success building my team and my, 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 my block up in, in, in Maryland, um, things go bad. Me being a knucklehead, I'm going, I'm going to drop off a G-Pack, which is a $1,000 pack of product to one of my workers. I got a loaded gun on me, making sure I protect myself. They're all in my stash box in my truck. And I pull, in, I pull up to a Chinese restaurant. I pull up to a Chinese restaurant and I pull up in a fire zone, right? So I got a big red truck, three miles from West Virginia in a hick town called Cumberland, Maryland. I'm selling dope and I got the music blaring and I'm parked in a fire zone. So the police pull up behind me and they're like, license, you know, and insurance and all that. So I give them my license and the cop is like, hey, he sees my name. Now, two days prior, the same officer had run down on my block to search everybody. You know, I never had nothing. I'm just watching. I'm just there watching everybody do what they do. And so he asked me my name two days prior. And I told him my name was Jason Tyke. Just made some crap up. Now he pulled me over in front of the, or, or pulled up behind me in front of the fire zone. He gets my ID and he sees my name. He's like, that ain't what you told me the other day. I'm like, that wasn't me. I wasn't here the other day. I know what you're talking about. So he's trying to talk to me, me being a knucklehead, a hothead, thugging. I turn the music up on him. Listen to Jay-Z Reasonable Doubt. I turn the music all the way up on him and just lean back in my chair. Like, get out my face. So the cop walks away from the car comes back with another cop, asked me to step out, and he locked me up. Now, while I'm locked up, I'm like, oh, snap, I got these drugs and this gun, and they bring the dogs. So they got dogs searching my vehicle, and I'm like, officer, officer, like, you know what I mean? I was just playing. I didn't really mean it. I'm trying to be a good boy now. I'm trying to put on my charm, right? Charm and disarm. I'm trying to, right? So he ain't trying to hear none of that now. And so they're searching the car. They can't find nothing. The dogs are going off, and they can't find my stash box. But they do find like $8,000 of money I had in some Jordans in the back of the truck that I didn't even know about. I didn't even know it was there. So now they really feel like they wanted something. And as my, I had somebody driving with me, uh, my, my passenger, they let him go. He walks all the way across this shopping center parking lot. And they're like, hey, hey, you, wait, come back here. We didn't search you. He walks all the way back. They search him and found a, a bag of weed in his little pocket. So they lock him up. Now they got more probable cause. So anyway, now they take me down to the precinct. I'm in jail and my stomach is turning. Because mind you, I'm out on bail in New Jersey. 
I'm on parole in New York. I know I got drugs in the truck and a gun, and now I'm in this little town in Maryland. So the officer comes back, and they're like, yeah, look what we got. And he's swinging the gun. Like, you're done, buddy. And they just happy as hell. So I'm just sick now. And it's a Friday night. I was supposed to be going out to the club. Now I'm in a holding cell. And they don't do bails on a weekend in, in Maryland. I had to actually wait till Monday. So now I'm waiting all weekend hoping that parole don't find out, New Jersey don't find out, they don't know about, that they don't find out about New Jersey parole to make sure I get a bail in Maryland so I can get out and fight my case. So I do get a bail, bail out, bail my co-defendant out. Um, they took my vehicle because of the drugs. Then they found my hotel key. It was like an old school hotel key with a number on it. It had no name on the hotel key at the hotel. My hotel wasn't even in that town because I was smart enough to know you don't hustle, you know, you don't crap where you eat. So somehow they found out my hotel was like three towns over, raided my hotel, found like more drugs, more money, my whole setup, and now I got more charges. So anyway, now I'm stressing. So now listen, I'm out on bail in New York, out on bail in Maryland, on parole, excuse me, I'm on parole in New York, out on bail in New Jersey, out on bail in Maryland, I go see my first lawyer, Ken Ravenel, in Baltimore, and I go get an estimate of what it's going to cost me to fight my case. He's like $25,000. So they done snatched up all my drugs, all my money, took my truck I just bought. Like, I got just issues, right? And so I went into straight depression, like 20 years old. My daughter's like two, three years old. I'm like, well, daddy's going to be gone forever. My first offer they gave me in Maryland was 15 years. That was the first offer I got was 15 years. So I'm like, yo, I'm not coming home till like I'm like 35 and I'm broke and I'm messed up. So I literally just let my hair grow out. I was just stressing. I was like full, like for sure, for sure, like like depressed. Like, yo, this is like, it's, it's over. Like I just, I just hung it up. And what I'm, so I'm telling my team is, I'm telling my corporate office this for a reason. And after just, I slept. I mean, I literally slept for like a month or two. I just slept all day, every day. I just slept. I didn't want to get out the bed. I just felt everything was over. And I just know any dad go to New York for parole, they could lock me up. Court could go bad, whatever. And then one of my partners at the time, who, you know, whatever, he's just like, yo, listen, you could do all this crying, sleeping, all this, all this depressed you want. Like, that ain't going to change nothing. He's like, yo, you better get the getting. You better get out in this block and act like there's some money out here. And something in that just snapped something in me. And it's just like, yo... If I just sink into my depression, my daughter, I'm not, I'm not giving myself a fighting chance in this situation. My daughter can't eat. I'm going to prison. I'm going to be broke. Like, yo, like I can't go out like no sucker. I can't go out like that. And so I snapped out of it. Like, I got a, I got a front from my man. Like, I'm getting an upfront loan of some product. I got back to the block. Got back to grinding. Made some moves down. I just did what I had to do, and I grinded it back up. Started paying off a lawyer to 25 grand, chipping them away. Like going back and forth, and I and I made the most out of my situation. The lawyer ended up finding out the cops illegally searched my vehicle. They still didn't have a right to search my vehicle when they originally searched it. So we were able to negotiate my 15-year plea down to 18 months. And then New York never found out about my charge, so I ended up going off parole. I was out on bail for like eight months. I ended up stacking up my bread back. Um, Got another lawyer to fight to get my truck back. He eventually got my truck back for me. I mean, I was in prison when he did, but I got my truck back. Uh, did my 18 months. I told you the stories of how I met Michael Lipscomb, my cellmate in Maryland. This is how I got there. And my point is, and I'm here today and everything else you know about me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But my point is, I say thug motivation. What I'm trying to say is like, no matter what you up against in life, you got two options. You either going to fight it out, you going to thug it out, you going to grit your teeth, you going to go get it, or you going to get you going to give up and be a doormat and be ran over. Like you only really got two options, but you only got one life. Like there is no sequels. Like there's no redos. So, I told my team today, I'm like, you know, how Hove said, in this game you got valleys and peaks. Expectation for dips, for precipitation we stack chips. So it's like, yo, stay on your grind. Prepare for rainy days. Prepare, prepare for your peaks, or for your valleys. You're going to have peaks. You have up times where you're the man. Instagram popping, bank account popping, your woman's fine, you cook, all that. But then you're going to hit some hurdles, some unexpected things that's going to throw you for a crazy loop. 
like things that may be out of your control. They may actually, the worst things are the things that's your fault. Not even things out of your control. The things that you might have done, you screwed up. But yo, you only got two options in the situation. Even if you did screw up, even if the pressure is on, even if the bank account is low, even if your woman leaves you, your man leaves you, no matter what happens, you still got two options. You gonna be a doormat? You gonna lose? You gonna give up? Or you gonna grind it out? You gonna dust yourself off? And you gonna be the, 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 the excellence, the greatness, the superhero, the MJ, Jackson, Jordan, Tyson, pick one. You gonna be great. You gonna be the greatness that you are. And so, that's my message today. It's just motivational. It's just, again, this is how I get through life. I get through life understanding that this is my jaywalk, that no matter what I go through, I still only got two options, complaining and crying about it, being in your feelings, being in your moods, all that, your end result is still what? You still have to do something to make the most out of the one life that you got. There's no other choices. Or you could just be that person. Like, damn, homie, in high school, you was the man, homie. Like, before, you were you were it. And that just drives me. I don't never want to be the has-been. That's one of my biggest motivations. I don't never want to be the J... Oh, you was the guy with the J. Morris Academy. Or you was the guy with the Tulsa Real Estate Fund. I don't never want to be the has-been. I'm never going to be the has-been. Because I'm always going to climb up out of whatever. I'm going to rise from the dirt without a stain on my shirt. And I want to give you that inspiration, that motivation, that instruction is no matter what you're going through, just always ask yourself, whatever your name is, name, what are we gonna do about this? We gonna, we gonna cry foul, we gonna complain, we gonna, we, gonna, we gonna give up on this, or we gonna shake it off, we gonna get to getting. And so this is what you guys gotta do out here, no matter what you're facing in life, I don't care about your background, I don't care about your education, I don't care about how many kids you got, I don't care, oh man, like, listen, nobody cares about that, the world don't care. But you got to have enough within you to push you to be your best you. And then make the best decisions you can make with the hand that you were dealt or the hand that you dealt yourself. Always just make your best moves and let the chips fall where they may, but you will live and die with, yo, I gave my life the best shot. And that's how we move out here. This is Jay Walk episode five. Make sure you like, subscribe, and share this. Don't cheat the people. And keep this information, this inspiration, this instruction in this game to yourself, share it, not just for me, but that's your way of planting seeds out in the world and doing your good deed. Share it, like it, comment below. Let me know how you like this series. Make sure you subscribe to all the channels, YouTube, Mr. J. Morrison, Facebook fan page, Mr. J. Morrison, Instagram, Mr. J. Morrison, and I'll see you guys on the next one, episode six, merchandise at treflife.com. Treflife, see you then, peace.